the job does change the way that you view everything. Uh, it changes the way that the brain responds to its environment um, and how that shows up at home might not always be comfortable, uh, especially for the first responder family members. Um, and if they're not informed of those responses, especially the first responder, you're not doing them any, any favor. We're kind of just asking them to white knuckle the career and be like, good luck, everybody. And we know from the statistics, the divorce rates, the anxiety, the depression, the suicide rates, um, you, you can't do it that way. Like something has to change. You don't always have a lot of time to slow down. You don't have any time to actually fully process like, wow, what did I just experience? Because now you're, you're going to the next call. You go, 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 and then you get home, and then your system's like, go, 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 and there's no moment for pause. And when you allow the go, 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 and the trauma and the threat to build over years, many first responders um, don't want to pause. I always say for first responders, their silence isn't always quiet. Um, when they are silent, when they actually stop and sit, there's a lot of intrusive thoughts that can come up. Memories haunt them, and that can catch up. And now we don't have resilience. You know, you love your family members, you want them to be okay, and you watch them go and, and serve their communities in a way which is where the family member pride comes in, but not without consequences. Um, and the first responder family members have to be taken care of too, which again is really what fuels me to, um, you know, having that front row seat for my dad and my brother. You look at these departments and you're like, please take care of them. Like, please take care of them. And when I hear you say you don't have a wellness budget, get one. Get one. You're listening to the ATO Bridging the Divide podcast, brought to you by the Assist the Officer Foundation. Since 1999, the ATO has given assistance to the first responder community, and now we want to give them a platform to hear their incredible stories. We also want to hear the stories of the many people that support us. Our community is small, but it is strong. We have differences. We don't always agree and we all make mistakes. But together we can grow, we can heal. And we can learn from those mistakes. And together we can bridge the divide. Welcome back, ATO listeners. I'm Missy here with Joe and Josh, the greats. <laughs> Before I introduce our guest, I ask you to consider one of those crazy hard puzzles where all the pieces they blur together. It may be sitting in an unorganized mess on a table. It's overwhelming, and you're never sure where to start. When, it, when it's complete, it's unique and gorgeous, like art. You can see the distinct details very clear. You younger listeners may have never worked one of those puzzles, so use your imagination. Now consider taking snapshots of your life, your family, childhood, your career, critical incidents, medical runs, joy and sadness, guilt, anger, alcohol, parenting, self-hate, resentment, numbness, and even war. Capture all of it. Everyone's snapshots are unique and blur together in a complicated, overwhelming life puzzle. Now place those photos in a bag, those integral puzzle pieces. Don't bend, cram, or rip them, just bag them up. Here's where our specialized guest comes in. She is a brilliant life puzzle tactician. She systematically takes your photos, those puzzle pieces specific to you, out of your bag, and methodically teaches you to put those complicated pieces together with patience and evidence-based techniques. Your puzzle isn't broken. Allow her expertise to guide you in reconstructing and framing your peculiar art. Dr. Twiddell grew up in California. Don't judge. <laughs> uh, she has intense Texas tenacity. She earned a doctorate in forensic psychology and a lifelong education in our culture, growing up with a police officer dad and a mother that was a nurse, with both had 30, over 30 years of experience in their expertise. Her brother is also a police officer and a military veteran. They are still part of her team today. 
Our guest has immersed herself in emergency rooms, hospitals, corrections, fire, rehabilitation to sharpen a practice geared for the first responder culture. She provided cr critical incident debriefs, therapy training, and peer support programs for the Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department. This one's for you, Josh. She is the coxswain of the first responders mental health journey. Yes, that's a rowing reference. She moved her team here to Frisco, Texas, and founded FIRST to guide this voyage. It's an all-inclusive, personal approach to mental strength. I will let her expand on the details shortly. FIRST helps our culture push past the pain barrier and keep pulling oars in a lively direction when every muscle fiber and conception screams stop. She diminishes the mental mindset of seeking guidance, is weak or character flaw driven, and gives you a proactive perspective to tackle whatever complicated puzzle pieces present themselves. Dr. Twiddell's holistic approach embraces our unique careers, exhausting personalities, and lifestyles. She has all kinds of methods in her arsenal to put that puzzle back together. She is the mental health assassin that is present fighting for you. An avid runner, mother of two, wife, and profound professional. Please welcome Dr. Heather Twiddell, Dr. T. Dang. Thanks. Missy. Thank you for coming. Oh my gosh. I feel like there's nothing left to say. Like that's. Yep. The mic drop. Do we, just, do we just sum it up? Yeah. <laughs> Thank, no, I intro. appreciate that. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited to be She's, here with you guys. She does the best intros. Not really. No, she does. <laughs> no, that was incredible. How long did it take you to write that? <laughs> I'm not going to tell you that, Josh. <laughs> that's beautiful. Thank you. I, I have a paper due soon. I just didn't yeah. want any like. Let's talk. <laughs> cock, cock. Oh, Thank sorry. You. Is that's that a play awesome. on words? Cop humor on my rowing reference. <laughs> I like it. It's a good job, Miss. Growing up in California with parents, a, a cop and mm -hmm. a nurse. Tell us what that was like. Yeah. So, oh my gosh, my a little bit of a, some adrenaline junkies in there, right? Um, gosh, my family is a fun one. We still all get together um, now on the weekends, and we just love being around each other. And I really don't know anything different than to be a part of a first responder family. Um, and it's an honor to be a part of the first responder family members. You know, it's um, it's a bigger family. And so to be a part of FIRST and to be sitting here with you guys, um, I'm truly just connected to this line of work and connected to the humans that I get to work with on a daily basis. Um, so, yeah, my like I said, my family, it was like an exodus out of California. We all, um, no one was going to go alone. It was like, okay, if you're going, we're going. So my parents went. Um, my brother, who's a police officer, like you mentioned, him and his whole family went, and then my husband and myself and our two kids, we were the last to come. But all of that happened probably within seven months of each other. And we haven't looked back. Um, I mean, thank you, sunny Southern California, for <laughs> for my upbringing and Disneyland and all that good stuff. But Texas is awesome. I mean, I feel... I feel very uh, welcomed by, by Texans, and I like to just pretend that I am one. So, so yeah. Well, we're fortunate. <laughs> we really are. Yeah, do you like that Texas heat? Yeah, no. <laughs> I do. You really? know what? It doesn't bother me that much because I know that there's a season change coming. Unlike Southern California, you know, 72 and sunny is really nice, but every day, like, there's no change. So we would be swimming, like, in the pool on Christmas Day. Um, it doesn't really feel like a... A season it just feels like kind of a lot of the same so like I said weather was incredible but for me like s changing seasons is nice it's a reminder that we're part of something bigger um, and you can't get too comfortable because that's how life is we we change seasons in 24 hours here <laughs> that's right and then right back to the next <laughs> was your dad a big city cop um Anaheim PD so you know that's I think but between three and four hundred sworn but they dealt a lot with you know Dis Disneyland sure. and my dad was SWAT my brother was SWAT as well um and so a lot of human trafficking a lot of gangs um they still you know they still were a pretty busy department wow yeah and then your mom was she what kind of nurse was she so she started as an ER nurse um, and then she, gosh, 33 years of, of that. And so she started as an ER nurse and then worked her way all the way up to VP of, um, Southern California, you know, healthcare system. And wow. Yeah. She's still a nurse today. So, and then my dad retired. Um, but like many 
first responders who retire, got bored real quickly. And so now he actually works for Northrop Grumman um, doing crisis security and international work with that. So cool. So the adrenaline continues. Can't, we're a family that can't sit down for very long. <laughs> Where do you get yours? Uh, from from them, um, <laughs> I think, you know, just having kind of a fast pace and, um, you know, having family members who holidays had to get switched up and you'd be at a, a birthday party and then someone's getting called out for a SWAT call. So you have to learn to adjust and it kind of always keeps you on your toes. Um, and I think that kind of just created this fast pace, um, you know, readiness for life, which I think is something that's good, but it can also be something where sometimes it's nice to just sit and feel like you can expect, like, we're all going to stay at this dinner. No one's going to get called out. We can all just, you know, be present. Um, but you never have that guarantee as a first responder family member. Um, because the, the, when the job calls, you know, human beings have to have to go and that means family members have to adjust. So I, I, I honestly think that has helped shape. Um, I know it has shaped who I am today as far as constantly on to like the next of like okay how can we do this how can we do that um which has played a big part in firsts um you know progress and development so yeah out of all these things that you've done with los angeles county sheriff and and prisons or corrections which one of the uh, these aspects do you feel like taught you the most and prepared you for what you're doing now oh gosh it all has i mean every experience i feel like in our life it like shapes you and better prepares you even the negative ones um because with all of you know the dynamics of those different types of work um it's not always easy but um and sometimes you question yourself and sometimes you walk away from those jobs and it it feels heavy um but you allow it to shape you in a way to again be on your toes um you can't ever get complacent in this type of of work because you need to um you need to stay sharp and you need to be tactful not only on the job, but after, kind of the same way that you guys do, and I encourage you guys to. Um, So I think it's all majorly prepared me. Um, I think, you know, coming from a first responder family, that prepared me for this type of work. I grew up, you know, doing ride-alongs with my dad. I always wanted to pull everybody over, and there was like a slice of a moment where I wanted to be a police officer, and my dad was like, "Mm." (laughs) hmm. I will support you whatever you do, but I prefer not. Um, But then for me, once I started taking a few psychology classes, I was like, okay, this is where where I'm actually – I really like this piece of it. Um, And honestly, I didn't even know I was going to go into becoming a first responder psychologist. The forensics part of it really was exciting. Um, And then one thing kind of, you know, each experience led to the next. And then that's where I ended up at L.A. County Sheriff's Department. Um, And that's a huge department. That's 8,000 sworn – and we were day one at the academy making sure, you know, these these newbies with their family members sitting next to them knew about how the job was going to change them. Not to scare them off, um, but to be realistic. Like, we're not going to sugarcoat this. Like, the job does change the way that you view everything. Uh, it changes the way that the brain responds to its environment. Um, and how that shows up at home might not always be comfortable, uh, especially for the first responder family members. Um, and if they're not informed of those responses, especially the first responder... Um, you're not doing them any, any favor. We're kind of just asking them to white knuckle the career and be like, good luck, everybody. And we know from the statistics, the divorce rates, the anxiety, the depression, the suicide rates, um, you, you can't do it that way. Like something has to change. Um, and so that's really a lot of also where first came into play. Um, sometimes I describe it like if, you, if I were to ask you guys, how, like what percentage of the calls that you go on could have been prevented, Right. Prevented as far as in what way? Well, you show up and maybe someone's decision or someone's recklessness, like it didn't have to go this way because it, it, it could have been it could have been prevented at some point, right? right? A lot of times I hear, gosh, like 90%, like this didn't have to go this way. Yeah, there's, right? I think that we're, I know that I second guess myself a lot on calls when I was out on the streets and, and wishing I could have done things differently. <clears throat> and also replaying replaying almost upset obsessing over it of uh things that i've that i'm you know mistakes i made and i wish i could have done better sure. uh, to make it to make the whole situation better and sometimes i i feel that i've made the situation worse in some in some cases yeah are are you referencing <clears throat> how we would change it or how possibly 
in the world perspective of it, you know, how that could have been prevented if the other party hadn't had this or if these two things didn't come together or. Yes. More of that piece. Okay. But Joe, what you're speaking to, I think is something really important to come back to because it's so common for first responders to go back to like the shoulds of the call. The replay. Uh huh. Yeah. Um, but yeah, thinking of, you know, the, like when the 911 call comes through, the reason why you guys are showing up, a lot of times it didn't have to go that way. It could have been prevented, but now you guys have to show up. We have to clean call. up the mess right. that somebody else started. Yeah, and I think it's unpreventable. I mean, we don't predict that. We can't control that. And so, yeah, I mean, I see what you're saying. Yeah. It's, sometimes they're that's all that way. <laughs> how I have felt doing this type of work and sitting with thousands of first responders doing these types of sessions, um, sometimes I get there meaning like to the therapy session and i'm like oh my gosh this didn't have to go this way this could have been prevented we could have been way more tactful with how we we approach this for this individual um and a lot of times it does come from the department it becomes and it comes from the lack of knowing the impact of this line of work um you know i I see plenty of command staff who they say gosh i wish i would have known this 20 years ago and so there's a part of me because my dad falls in that group there's a part of me where I'm like, yeah, like you should have known this, but I have some grace because as, as easy as it might be to get, as a, especially as a family member, to be angry at the department, like why didn't you take better care of my first, like of my family member? Um, I have a little bit of grace because we just didn't know as much about the brain 20 years ago. I mean, we've we've learned major things about the brain even in the last three years. So the part where I get frustrated now is more when I find out departments are still doing it the way that they did it 20 years ago and now we know and they're just still taking the approach of you know wellness isn't important or when they say like well we don't have a budget for wellness and my mind is just like do you see that mainly in the smaller departments or the larger departments that are more resistant to change i see it both really Um, i think that i think it's such an individualized piece and a a big part of it has to do with who's at the top um we can't just get better at you know, oh, make sure the newbies have it, the new generation, because you can make sure the new generation has it. But if you put them into a department where some of the older crusty guys and gals at the top still don't really, you know, highlight or um, support wellness, it's not going to go very far. Um, and so it's, it's funny because when I do, I, I love talking to some of the resistant crustier <laughs> officers because um, it's funny when I hear things like, well, I just don't really believe in that and I'm thinking well it's not I mean it's not like Santa Claus it's not like (laughs) we believe in mental wellness um if if you're saying that for me it's more you then maybe what you mean to say is you just don't really know how our system works the brain the mind the body it's all connected right so it's the stuck in the this is the way we've always done it mentality Mm -hmm. and that's with everything with in the approach to mental health uh, even uh, as far as police tactics there's still a lot of people well we've always done it this way well everything can be done more efficiently Right. Well, Clearly, think, it's a problem. I right. think you could you could correlate that too to uh, I, I would put it toward uh, the police community in general, and then you take the tactical community and how it was always. Oh, that's that's for the SWAT guys. You know, they're going to do all the shooting and all this stuff. When really, and with time, this is integrated in, and it's shown like, hey, no, this is for everyone, right? But it's not normally it's not normal that way, right? So people's image of doctors may be the ones they see after a shooting. And then those people talk about, well, all the guy wanted to know is if I was crapping good or not, or what, whatever it may be. And I, well, what the hell am I going to go talk to somebody like that about? And then you, it progresses right to where it's like, now you get more people are exposed to it, have a positive input, come back, share that with somebody else. And now it's more prevalent, right? Because coming back from, uh, war America, you know, the war fighters coming back from, overseas of course the veteran community was highlighted in a sense that hey we're taking care of them not only physically but mentally um and then slowly but surely now it's being taken on by individuals such as yourself there's not many of you out there i'm sure there are there's more than i know you could be a better one to tell us the the exact number of individuals such as yourself that are out there that actually push this line of work or Mm. or your interest lies with this. This is your specialty and all the work that you've done. I'm sure there's more of them, but there's probably not that many of them. So, I mean, just like your group first, I mean, how many people do you think you would see now, uh, let's just say this current today compared to a year ago today, you know, 
it's the word has gotten out through right. those through the uh, resiliency deals you do up there the three days, and that's where people are like, holy crap! Because just like you, you know, your first piece of your deal, you could drop a pin in there. There's not a person on a cell phone. Everyone's in there can relate to a piece, and now they own it. And so I'm just rambling on. I see your face. No, no, I was going to have her explain yeah. so they so our listeners understand the the program in detail. Yeah. That and your theories and and how you attack it. So break it down for us. What is first? So first, I, I mean, I initially started when I came over to North Texas. Um, I wanted to create basically a menu of services of a lot of the things that I did for LA County Sheriffs. Um, Because like I said, 8,000 sworn, they could afford to have 12 of us on staff as law enforcement psychologists. Um, But just like my dad and brother's departments, three to 400 sworn, that tends to be the more average size across the country. Um, So a lot of departments can't afford to have a law enforcement psychologist on staff. But it doesn't mean that they shouldn't have access to resiliency type training and support. So when I moved to North Texas, um, I developed first and really just wanted to take that approach of let me just create a menu of service. And I started this like North Texas tour of just starting to reach out to chiefs and whoever I could just to better understand what do you have in place when it comes to resilience and wellness for your department members, right? Um, And that's really just how I started first because the more information I learned about what the departments locally needed, it really helped me then shape, okay, what do I need to kind of focus on? And one thing I learned moving here, um, and I think this is common for a lot of departments, is I always want you guys to think of this career in three columns. You have your pre-escalation, then you have your escalation when it hits the fan, and then you have your de-escalation. And what I've noticed is departments have gotten better at the de-escalation. Um, maybe they throw EAP at you. Maybe they throw a debrief or two at you. Um, you know, they have treatment centers. But that's that's good. But when you have one population that is constantly either needing treatment or the suicide rate is much higher than the general population, anxiety, depression, Uh, we're clearly not doing something on the first column. We're not doing enough in the pre-escalation. You're not informing, you're not training, um, you're not taking an active approach to their wellness, and that's why then they end up in column two when it's hitting the fan, and then now there's just the de-escalation piece, right? So my goal was to um, really let first be a part of each of those columns. So yes, I do the trauma processing and the debriefs um, and the therapy. um, And that's for first responders and their family members. Um, But first really prides itself also on the pre-escalation side um, because training is so important. Um, a, A good first responder is one who's informed. And I often describe this career as kind of like a bad human experiment where um, you are taking human beings' lives, you're taking their brains, and you are going to expose them to things that are going to change them physically, physiologically, emotionally. Um, And you're not, just like with any human experiment, you have to give people the risks. So you guys learn about like, yes, you could die. You could lose your life. You might see some bad things, but no one's giving you the risk of how this might change your relationships, how this might change how you feel as a human, how this might change how you dream at night, um, your discomfort in crowds, um, some of the avoidance that you might pick up because the world is now one giant threat. Like no one gives you that information. And again, this is where we just leave it to white knuckle. Um, And then you add the stigma on top of it where if you are noticing those things, you're not supposed to say it or you guys are notorious for comparing yourselves to one another. So it's like, well, if he he seems fine, like what's wrong with me? Um, So training for me is give them all the information as soon as you can. Um, And some departments, like I just did a a recruit training and they had their spouses with them and I loved it because I'm like day one, let me just give you all of this so that you can now watch out for it and you can work together as a team. So first does the training piece. Um, You mentioned the three-day. So we do a three-day peer support resiliency training. Peer support is an incredible piece to have as part of any department. It's like your boots on the ground. Let your peers um, keep an eye out for each other. But even with that and the three-day, I don't think you can just train the peer support members um, because everyone is a peer to each other. You know, you might be more comfortable talking to him even though you have a person over there who's a peer member. So everyone needs to be informed of what the job does to them so that they can be more aware and then they can be able to, you know, provide support for their their peers. So 
First is kind of this comprehensive approach to it um, where I know of how tricky trauma and threat exposure is. Like as a psychologist, I'm still only a slice of, of the whole pie. Um, you have to have the physical component. You have to have the nutrition component. They have to be informed on how to manage their money. There has to be a spiritual component. Um, it, 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 it's all together. So when I learned about a sports academy at the Star in Frisco and basically everything they do for – they work with the average Joe, but they also work with um, elite athletes, right? So they work a lot with um, professional athletes and they have a recovery lounge. Again, they have the nutritionists, they have strength and conditioning, they have a cognition lab um, to make sure the executive functioning is working. As soon as I walked in there, I was like, this is incredible. Um, Our first responders need to be in a facility like this because you guys are athletes, right? And, And I always joke, until I can figure out how to get you all paid as much as professional athletes. Please work on that. Um, I'm working on it. <laughs> Until we can get that, you should absolutely have access to the same types of resources that they have. Um, and so that's where Sports Academy and First joined forces um, and now have developed. Basically, it's still First, but the menu of services just has just expanded to include the physical component um, where if there's also an injury concern or injury susceptibility, there's the manual therapy piece. The Cognition Lab is really something that's cool um, and that can be remote. And so we take the iPads and we can go to your trainings, put you in situations where your heart rate's elevated, whether it's out at the range, um, during scenario testing, and then in, in the middle of that, during fight or flight, actually test where your cognitions are at, meaning your recall, your working memory, your processing speed, um, all of that can be tested and, and it can be improved because we know that part of the brain goes offline when fight or flight's activated. So really cool technology through this merge with Sports Academy. Um, and I'm really excited because the whole goal is to have it be this one-stop shop where first responders and their family members can come in and we can just take an individualized approach. I think that's also what's really unique about FIRST is um, sometimes up to this point how you guys are you know, evaluated, um, assessed on an annual basis. It's like this blanket that you just fall under, but, you know, a 42 year old who's been doing this for X amount of years, isn't going to perform probably the same way as the newbie who's, you know, 19 and hasn't had X years of, of trauma exposure. So really just looking at where is this human being at? Um, and how can we, we help them? So first, and so that's really how first is expanded. Um, on the therapy side, like I said, I think we have 10 therapists now who i interview all of them and make sure that there's cultural competence. Um, That's a huge piece because like you said, it is harder to find um, the specialty of working with first responders. There's a lot of really good trauma therapists out there, but you can't just do trauma. You have to be able to know how to address trauma and also understand this this line of work Um, or else, you know, you may end up in a someone's office who's good at trauma, but they're they're not going to be able to relate to how the how the work impacts you as a person. So, um, so yeah, anyone can call first, and whether it's the therapy, whether it's the training, whether it's us coming out to their department, um, it's all available here in North Texas, but we do have solutions that we're hoping to scale to other states as well. But for right now, our focus is North Texas. The, the ATO is uh, actually everybody in this involved in this podcast has gone to your three-day training, your peer support and res- resiliency training. And it was phenomenal. And it actually is what planted the seed for this this podcast. I right? had an idea, and then you ha- there's a portion of the training that has a panel of 10 first responders, and you give them all X amount of time to tell stories of their critical incidents or their basically the way their life fell apart and why. And listening to that, I was like, that. Is, this needs to be heard. It was really powerful. I was looking around the room. Nobody was playing on their phone. Everybody was engaged and head nodding and wincing. And it was really a powerful moment uh, just watching uh, first responders, police, and fire from all over the Metroplex, fire from Flower Mound to Garland to DPD to Salina were there. Right. It was really uh, – and it's a really an impressive training, and I recommend anybody that hasn't gone to it to go through it, especially the first responders. Thank you. Well, I think the really cool piece about it is we have, like, those brave individuals who are stepping forward who are, are kind of saying, like, enough is enough. I'm tired of, of doing this the way I've been doing it where we just don't say anything. So 
I've I've observed all it takes is you know one first responder to even start the conversation of how this has actually impacted them, how it's changed their life, and now you have a, a, a crowd basically saying like, whoa, first of all, we don't we don't usually talk like this, but now that you are talking like this, like holy hell, you're you're, you're telling my story too, and now all of a sudden you have this like universality of wow, this, this does impact all of us. Maybe this goes a little bit deeper than just, oh, you're weak if you can't handle it. It goes to the human component. Right. And um, I think that's a huge, powerful piece of the training. It felt, it, it felt like a safe haven to, to tell your story, and you gave them a stage to talk. And then um, just everything else, the nutrition part and, you know, and, and the diet for first responders and, and the importance of sleep. Yeah, they, that's that's other topics you cover. It was just such a good training, even the physical fitness uh, aspect. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, no. The, so the first team, I'm really proud of the team we put together of experts. That includes uh, a doctorate of physical therapy, board certified human performance coaches. Um, like you said, we also are working with Thorn, and so they are like top notch when it comes to nutrition and supplementation. They're the only supplementation um, company out there that is backed by the Mayo Clinic, so everything's very science based. They help, you know, military Olympians get ready for the Olympics. Again, professional athletes. So the fact that we now have their um, investment and involvement in the first responder world so that if you are struggling with energy levels or you're struggling falling asleep or staying asleep or you're struggling with your mood um, sometimes first responders don't want to take a medication for that supplementation is you're not putting anything different in your system it already has you're just putting something in there to help it you know the catalyst of what stress aging trauma throughout all of that breaks down and then makes those things hard to do like energy and maintaining a good mood and falling asleep without any issues so the supplementation piece is just a really nice alternative to popping a um, sleeping pill that then makes you feel like crap and grogginess the next day um, and knowing that you guys have shift work you can't you can't always afford to feel that way you guys use the word resiliency mm-hmm I don't want that to just be a buzzword or yeah. talk about it. Define it. What does it mean to you? Yeah. Um, I'm glad you mentioned that because I do feel like resilience is this, you know, this word right now that everyone's using. Like, you have to have resiliency. Um, if I were to really pull back from that word, I think in order to be resilient, it has to start with self-awareness. Like you have to be an aware human um, because I can't just say like, oh, you're a first responder. Like this is what you need. Y you have to be able to say like, well, this is actually how I'm feeling or this is um, how the how the negativity shows up in my life or this is these are some of the decisions I've made that aren't super healthy. If you're not aware of those things, um, and awareness, we all have it. We just sometimes forget to use it. Um, and I think the primary reason first responders forget to use it is what I like to call the bulldozing effect, where the job has kind of conditioned you in that way to just, you know, you, you don't always have a lot of time to slow down. Like one bad call comes in, you don't have any time to actually fully process like, wow, what did I just experience? Because now you're, you're going to the next call, right? So you're just you're, you're go, 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 and then you get home, and then your system's like, go, 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 and there's no moment for pause. Um, and when you allow the go, 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 and the trauma and the threat to build over years, many first responders um, don't want to pause because I always say for first responders, their silence isn't always quiet. Um, when they are silent, when they actually stop and sit, there's a lot of intrusive thoughts that can come up. Um, memories haunt them. They, they go to places where they don't, that's not comfortable. So instead, they've learned to just go, go, go and distract and avoid, um, and that can catch up. And now we don't have resilience. Um, we don't have endurance to be able to keep doing this job. It breaks them down. They get burnt out. Um, so for the resilience piece, like you have to be aware, and then you have to be able to say, yeah, this is where I'm not healthy, or this is where I could probably do this better, or this is where um, you know this might be even wrong what I'm doing. Once you then know that, then you can take action. You can recognize it. You can shift the way you're doing it. You can communicate differently. You can practice that vulnerability. Um, and when you have all those things in place, now people can connect with you. Um, and that's, for me, the true resilience is to be able to utilize what is available to you both internally and externally, right? A really well-rounded first responder is one that doesn't just rely on what's out here. 
like, oh, this relationship makes me feel better, or oh, this alcohol makes me feel better, or oh, this sleeping pill makes me feel better, um, or just completely distracting myself and never looking at anything makes me feel better. If they can also get good at, well, what can I do right here within myself that makes me feel better? Um, giving myself some grace, giving myself some pause moments. Um, how you breathe is is a huge piece. How you move your body. Um, if you're drinking water, I mean, all of those things. If you can have internal out and external in mechanisms, you will be resilient. Um, and I tell people, yes, this job is the hardest one on the planet. And I might be my- biased, but I truly feel that. But if you are aware and intentional, you can have a, a quality of life with this type of work. But first responders and first responder couples, you just have to work harder than the non-first responder um, because there's a huge physiological component that non-first responders and non-first responder couples, they don't have to deal with that part of it. And life is already hard. Um, Relationships are already hard. You had trauma and threat exposure on top of it, and you have to be way more aware, way more tactful. And if not, it it will divide. It will will cause problems. Self-awareness and self-observation are so key because – you know, officers, they need to notice themselves. They need to recognize that they're doing things that could be destructive, like drinking or just ruining their relationships uh, through risky behavior and reckless behavior. Right. That they're do- but they do that not even realizing they're doing it to cope with what they see. But they gotta, they got to be self-aware and observant of that. Right. And it helps to understand it, too, right? It helps to understand that your brain is an association maker, Um, it's going to associate your experiences with something. And so when you can better understand like how your system works and then why it's then manifesting the way that it is, sometimes when people better understand the why, they're more likely to actually make shifts. Um, And unfortunately, sometimes we're driven by um, negative consequences. So another great way to shift someone's patterns or behaviors is to have them look at, well, what what are the consequences if you continue this? Um, Because everyone at any point you could you could ask them what's one thing you're doing right now it's probably not the best for you and everyone has an answer right and then if you follow up with okay what are the consequences if you don't make a change here most people can have that moment of some self-awareness and then maybe they do something with the awareness maybe they don't but at least there's like that recognition they might get the ball rolling to realize that something's going on and something needs to be done about it right you mentioned dissociation is it good or bad? First responders are, are experts at this. Is it good or bad? And they take it too far? Are you saying associations or dissociation? Dissociation. dissociation. Yes. So kind of like the numbing out. Yes. Right? One of them are mechanisms that we, we've mastered. Right. And it is, um, it's wired within you. I mean, to dissociate and to numb out is part of the body's like deepest level of, of a coping mechanism. Um, and some people forget that the fight or flight does have that third F. It's fight, flight, or freeze. Um, and if you've ever been on like a really intense call and you felt frozen or you feel like I don't even have words for it, um, that is part of that coping mechanism. And if you think of back to associations, um, you know, it kind of comes back to, again, like the mental health piece of it is when you think of mental health, like what's the first thing you do think of usually for first responders? Like what is mental health? I think everyone's going to have a different definition. Yeah. I th- what's yours, Josh? Well... <laughs> I think I think when most people think of that, we we would call them, we would notify it as a forty six or something along the line where somebody's having some type of critical incident and you have to deal with them on the street. And most of the time, those individuals end up going to the, the hospital for psychiatric care. So if you speak medicine to a police officer or you speak psychiatric care to a police officer, usually that would be some of the things I think that somebody would associate themselves with because they're familiar with this call. They're familiar with what they've done to these people, what they've had to where they've taken the people, so on and so forth, and not necessarily unless they haven't had any experience with any psychiatric help or any counseling, then this may be the only thing they have, you know, unless someone in their family or unless they had to cope with some type of tragic event, and then thus they know this is associated with this. Mm -hmm. And so that's kind of where I would see it. I think most of the time when someone speaks medicine or something along those lines, especially when it comes to 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 mental health or psychiatric health, I think that would probably be the first thing that would come to my mind. Yeah, And which is so, it's a common response, but it's almost like mental health is associated with like being a mental case, (laughs) you know, where mental health is, it's a part of like our human 
capacity like mental health is part of like our emotional intelligence like our awareness like that's all part of mental health but sometimes it's associated with mental cases or psychiatric pathology out on the streets um yeah what's your response mental health like if i was to define it yeah it's um i think it's your core inner belief and what you say to yourself okay i like that response I like your answers <laughs> and your intros. No, Misty's <laughs> oh my very goodness. smart. What's yours, Joe? Just a <clears throat> I was, I was, yeah, you took mine, so oh. no. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I, I've been kind of unlucky and uh, also lucky when it comes to uh, mental health and, and, and uh, recognizing it and seeing it, because I worked at Terrell State Mental Hospital before uh, I started this job, mm-hmm. and it was really interesting coming in and seeing some of the aggressive people come in and... I was one of the orderlies, you know, kind of the people in the white coats. We said, we didn't wear the white coats. And we had to fight, and we had to drag them to the seclusion room. And we also had to chart for the doctors to chart their behaviors so the doctors could come in and give the appropriate medic- medication to them. But then you just see such a degree of extreme and to it, it, just different extremes and uh, – the type of people uh, that would come in with a different different problems. They were similar problems, but they were all uniquely different. Uh, I worked on the forensic, the criminally insane unit. Uh, mm-hmm. That was really scary. And I worked on the adolescent unit. And then uh, mm-hmm. even the geriatric unit I had to work on, which was just depressing. Uh, it was, it really helped me learn how to deal with unpredictable people, but then also empathize with them when it comes to uh, seeing that type of behavior. And back then I knew all the different kind of medicines, the the Ativan, the Halidol, I think I'm saying it right. But there's been so many kind of medications that basically they were missing something chemically in their head and the medicine would come in and it would replace it. But it would, it was never this, it was never normal though. Yeah. It never is, it, you're, you're replacing something, but it's not, it's never going to be hundred percent normal. There's yeah. always still something off. And see that association. Oh, did you want to say something? No. That's oh, just amazing. Gonna, yeah. The association in the room can be a little bit negative when we say mental health, right? Mm-hmm. Which is typically where the stigma comes into play. But some of the things that you guys are talking about are like mood disorders or thought disorders, right? Mental health disorders, where mental health minus the, you know, the mental case or the psychiatric, you know, cases. Um, mental health is is to be human. It's to have emotions. It's to express emotions. It's to have awareness. It's to have clarity. It's to be able to um, share those things. To focus on, you know, something in front of yourself. Like that's mental health. So even if we just associate it with emotions, um, let's talk about what the role of emotions is when it comes to the first responder world. And let's be honest, too. I mean, all of you had lives before becoming a first responder, but I'll get to that in a second. But after after you are now a first responder, emotions now become what in the job? Are emotions helpful? Are they? It could be, it could be everything. They can be a lifesaver or they can kill you. Well, they can get you in trouble. Yeah. I mean, we have to really keep our emotions in check. Mm-hmm. Uh, otherwise, we'll be on the damn news and... Uh, and lose our job and it's over losing control of your emotions we right. really have to watch that and uh, it's we're human too I right mean, we see the worst things and we see the worst behavior and sometimes it's really hard to uh, keep that in check and not react uh in a way that can get our ass fired or get in trouble right or we don't want to embarrass ourselves either so you're basically asking your human part to not have a human response in those moments, right? Mm-hmm. You cuz if again, if you actually stopped and had an emotional response to really take in what is it that I'm experiencing, like th- this mother screaming, um the smell of this, like what I'm actually holding in my hands, like if you actually connected to the emotional piece of all of that it might interfere with officer safety it might interfere with how you perform like your efficiency at the call but the body hates denial but you guys have gotten really good at conditioning it to basically say not right now so the emotions are there so it's almost like not here not right now so you get really good at just shelving it um and i mean that allows you to then go to the next call um and so you kind of just throw all of it over here in this box and then you get home and you expect your system to just all of a sudden be emotional but you've literally trained it you've trained the brain to associate with emotions as something that's either not helpful something that could be um, an interference something that could be a burden and then you expect to get home and then all of a sudden 
be emotionally connected to everyone. It doesn't, it doesn't work that way. So this is a little bit where the dissociation piece comes in is your system has learned to shelf emotions. It has learned to detach so that you can just get the task done. Um, and again, the, this is what's hard for first responder family members is the things, the things that make you really good at your job, the things that keep you and others safe are the very things that can destroy your home life. Right. Mm -hmm. And so you have to practice like that emotional connection. You have to like recondition your system when it is home. Like how do I connect to this moment? And a lot of that is grounding techniques. A lot of it is that awareness to actually sit. And if you go home and like you're hugging your spouse or you're hugging your child, this might sound weird, but the way that we get grounded is through sensory input. Like hold your child when you're holding them. Right. When you come in and, and hug your spouse, like, don't be creepy about it, but like smell their hair, like feel their skin. Like you have to bring your body back to what is right here to encourage it to connect to that moment. If not, you'll you'll bulldo- you'll bulldoze at home too. It's hard you'll to get do. home and then you'll be disconnected yeah. and family members are like, what the hell's happening? And that emotional piece, you know, uh, I guess I was more referring to, I think a lot of times just... I'll just speak for me in general, but a, a, a lot of times you don't, you cannot afford yourself to have any type of an emotional input into something unless it's some form of empathy or you're helping a child or whatever it may be along those lines. Cause the rest of it, I look at it as a life-saving technique uh, more so, especially when we were doing a lot of stuff in SWAT you know, you learn to, to remove yourself from the world around you to focus on exactly what you're doing right now. Right. right. And, uh, but that comes with conditioning and with time. You know, I didn't learn that over there. I learned that from being at Southeast and you go from one place to another, one place to another, one place to another. And like you mentioned earlier, we don't take time to digest it. We don't. Sometimes we laugh about stuff and say, can you fucking believe what we just saw? You know, you can't. And you just move on. It becomes norm. You're just like, well, I mean, nothing's going to surprise you now. You can slap in the face and you're still like, well, I'm just not surprised. Right. You know, and then you talk about going home and and then you don't. You don't feel those things. You don't see those things you don't recognize those things because you're you're just in like this this place you know yeah. you're just like oh i don't even know yeah it's hard to explain but i mean you obviously know and i'm sure people that are listening will associate themselves or at least agree to disagree that yeah that's probably similar to what they i mean can you guys well i mean th- there's a um a reputation piece in there there's a um a pure piece where you can't be out there crying and right. you can't be showing emotions because you want to be the badass and you don't let that stuff in. You want to maintain your sharpness, you know, Absolutely. If that is a word. But, and, but that becomes habitual. <clears throat> yeah. And that's, I think, where you roll into the ego. Oh, yeah. And, and being sure. able to balance the ego with this job and then having Pride. good mental health. Talk to me about ego. Well... So with ego, I think it goes, and I want to just say one thing real quick before we move on to that, because when you, Josh, were talking about like you get home and you just don't really know what to do with it, this is where it's so layered because trauma and threat exposure, right, it's it's changing the physiological response, like you're constantly activating your fight, flight, or your freeze, right? So the more that thing fires, the better it gets and the stronger it gets. So that thing is learning to be really good at what it does. Um, so then when that thing's acting up on you at home, whether it's, it's being irritable or it's being short-tempered or it's being completely detached and numbed out, right? Whatever way the seesaw is working as it's trying to digest those things, this is where it's so complicated is I will say that Yes, trauma and threat exposure impacts every first responder in some way. It shows up in some way. I will say what spirals them further and what I see a lot in my office is the the narrative they start to put to those responses at home. So if it's like they get home and they're feeling numbed out, rather than knowing, okay, this is actually part of my digestion of what I just went through. This is actually normal. I, I'm, 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 I'm numbed out right now. I'm detached. There's things I can do to bring my system back online. I can try and be more tactful with this. But if they don't know that, then it's just this giant question mark of, you know, what's wrong with me? Well, I'm at my, my kid's seventh, you know, seven-year-old birthday party, and like I'm here, but I'm not really connected. Now they start putting a narrative to it. And this is where your response of like our mental health is our belief systems. Then the narrative can be can become, you know, gosh, I'm a shitty father or, 
what's wrong with me? Or like, do I not love this person anymore? And like all of a sudden the narrative takes over and our bodies don't just respond to what's happening in our reality. Our bodies also respond to how we're thinking. So now on top of what trauma and threats already done to your system, now you're at home acting a certain way. Now we're putting in a narrative. Your body's always listening to the narrative. So then you're having those thoughts. You're feeling that guilt. And now your body's releasing even more of a stress hormone because it's stressed out about what you're telling it. And what you're telling it in that moment is like, I'm not good enough or um, something's wrong with me. When first responders come into my office with those types of belief systems, yes, the trauma piece is going to come, but we, we've got to target those belief systems first because once those things are there, there is something called confirmation bias and it's very real. And now that's all the first responder can see. Like, look at what I did over here. I told you I'm a shitty dad. Or look what I did over here. Told you I'm not good enough. Or look what I did over here. I told you I'm disconnected. And now all they're seeing is all the ways that they're wrong or all the ways that they aren't good enough instead of pulling back, having that pause, seeking to understand it and being like, okay, there's something physiologically that's going and I need to be I need to be mindful of how I'm talking to myself too. Once you have all those components in place, then this is where that resiliency comes in too because you, you have to fight it. And there is going to be this internal battle for every first responder because their body's going to want to do something and you're going to, how you talk to it, what you let it do in that moment determines a lot. And you can't always let it show on duty. Like you said, it's officer safety is involved, but it's the off-duty piece that you have to be so, so tactful with. It's self-awareness. It goes back to recognizing it. Right. Or knowing. You'd Mm -hmm. have to have some type of education or introduction to, to even recognize, to be like, hmm, that's me. I feel like that's the unique thing about you, though. The first thing that you do is educate someone. And then if you understand, you're like, okay, well, I'm not the only person experiencing this, and I, it's not some big character yeah. flaw. Especially right. when you talk about the limbic system. When when you did that and explain your highs and lows, and then you have a bad day and a low and coming back up, I'm like, wow. Right. You know, that's where I think it gets everybody right there. That's why these departments, are. It, it's imperative that they start something to come in first, no pun intended, mm-hmm. to – recognize and address this before it becomes a problem educate everybody immediately and and, and our department is is uh, rolling out a new mental health uh, uh, peer support program that's coming up soon hopefully we can get you a meeting with uh, the person that's in charge of that and I it, I, I don't know what it's going to look like but it's going to be an improvement I believe doing something's better than nothing right you know and of course you may tweak it down the road but starting something don't just say oh we got a problem we got a problem and they don't do shit about it because nothing changes, right. right? And Mitzi, like you were saying, I've this is truly the job of like the dysregulated nervous system. There's such a physiological component to this job, and when you connect the first responder to their their own physiology, it helps them better understand. Like I am a working system. Like this body of mine, this brain of mine. Like these are tools, and I have to really understand how they work and realize that I'm also in charge of how they work, even though sometimes our, our bodies act up on us, especially for first responders, whether it's like a panic attack or when you are feeling numbed out. Um, that doesn't mean you've lost control. It's your body's way of saying something, right? Mm-hmm. And so when you connect people first on their physiology, for first responders, I've noticed then it allows you to then get to the more emotional piece of it and like connect to their belief systems and things like that, um, rather than coming in and being like, Let's all hold hands and talk about how we feel today. We talk about, you know, okay, of course this is happening in your system. You have to normalize it because that's how, like, it's incredible of how we're wired. Like, we are beautifully made. Like, this is a working system. But the limbic system, sometimes it overgeneralizes and it gets it wrong, right? And the part of your brain that identifies threat is faster than the part of your brain that puts a narrative to it. So it's not about never being triggered again. Right. If you're having triggers, if you're having them all the time and it's interfering with your ability to like enjoy your life, like let's take a look at that. But as a first responder and as a first responder family member, just because your loved one's having a, a triggered or a startled response, that's their limbic system doing what it's supposed to do. That's their limbic system protecting them. Right. Sometimes it gets it wrong. Um, if you think of, um, you know, someone who maybe has a, a piece of lint on their shirt and their peripheral vision gets wind of it and even like the biggest most macho guy you know looks down and then what do you see like oh shit. you know it's a, they, startle. They, yeah. it's a startle response they quickly like and then their brain the thinking part of the brain catches up and they're like oh it's just it's just a lint brain associated the lint with 
a bug or a spider and their heart rate went up, blood pressure went up and they had a, a response, right? They weren't thinking this lint is about to attack. We must get it off the shirt. No, you have it. It's just a reaction. <laughs> Everyone's checking, yeah. Right. Same way if you're, you know, walking your dog at night, you know, through the grass and, you know, you see a stick in a certain way and you think it's a, a snake. Your brain, you don't think it's a snake. Your limbic system identifies it as a snake. And then what happens? Your heart rate goes up, your blood pressure goes up. And then you realize, oh, it's just a stick. And then everything calms back down. So if you think of the first responder's limbic system, and this thing's an association maker, every call, whatever's involved in that call, the smell, the sounds, the sights, the tastes, that now is associated with a threat. Hmm. So if I'm over here off duty, and my brain even picks up something familiar to this incident, it could be a smell. Smells, it's one that gets a lot of my first responders, like walking into a barbecue joint for maybe like a firefighter or something, right? Smell of the, the, the cooking meat yeah. and the burn. Mm-hmm. And all of a sudden their heart rate's coming up and they're feeling a little bit uncomfortable. And they're thinking like, what the hell's wrong with me? This is weird. Your, your limbic system's trying to protect, but it's, it's overgeneralizing and it's getting it wrong, right? You can give yourself feedback in that moment. How you breathe is really important, but also just moving in the forward direction. So it's okay to get up from your seat let spouse, let family know, give me 10 minutes, step outside, get some fresh air, take a few deep breaths, help that thing calm back down, and then go back into that restaurant. Don't get in your car and go home and say, I'll see you at home, because then you've taught your system nothing new, right? But that part of your brain is faster. It has good intentions, but sometimes it del- its delivery sucks. And then the thinking part of the brain can help it out, right? That thinking part of your brain is your prefrontal, and that thing can act as like a like a brake system for an overactive limbic system. So it's not about never having a trigger. It's about when those triggers happen, how quickly can you identify it? How quickly can you help it, you know, regulate? And then use that energy in a way that's more more proactive. But you have to be proactive with yourself, though. You have to work on it. It doesn't right. just ha- – it, it, some people take years to, to improve. Right. And, and I've, you know, I mean, I, I believe that I'm a different person than I was two years ago. Mm-hmm. You know, emotionally, mentally, and physically, physically breaking down. But it, you know, I you just you have to work on it though. It takes a lot of work to to get something. If you don't, you just it's shit. It's just not just going to happen, right? And it's not going to be a sudden. Uh, it, it's not going to be a sudden change in yourself, right? You have to work on it. But how is this different to put the work in as? We, we go out to the range and we hone our shooting skills. Yeah. We, we go to the gym and we try to get in, in good shape. This is just one other aspect that where you have to put the work in. Absolutely. Yeah, first responders, we're terrible at it. We, yeah, we, our bench press is down or, we're, or I don't like the size of my quads now. I'm going to do more squats. You know, we, we don't work on this because I don't think we see it as a problem until we're falling apart. And oh. then we want to go see Dr. T. And why do you think you don't see it as a, a problem? Like who's who's responsible for that? I think maybe the culture has a lot to do with it. Mm. Just the the first responder culture over years and years, it's gotten a lot better, but right. it's still. I still don't think it where it needs to be. I think. Right. Well, I think it's. You could we could go the culture route, and I'm not going to point a finger at a department or a city, but I think it's uh, it's just again just you know it goes back to a lack of education, a lack of mm-hmm. knowing. You know, does this really exist? Um, you know. It, these smaller departments, well, that's not even true either because the departments that come over to your training, they're smaller departments. They're they're smaller in nature, but it's like you're stationed like right here, you know. Uh, they're, unfortunately, we can't clone you and like send you all throughout the U.S. to all these major cities and smaller cities and so on and so forth. But it's knowing that that's even out there, number one, even knowing what it is that, A, you have a problem or something that you might want to be cognizant of or something you might want to work on. Would be knowing you know what do i do next and uh, i don't think most people know that until like joe said well now it's time for me to work on something I'm, I'm, i've gone too far and hopefully we catch it before it goes to you know something tragic happening right uh, you know or something legal happening uh which would be another tragedy but just you know just don't know anything about it and that's unfortunate you know in my opinion i want to get back on the ego that misty brought up the officers good or bad does off, do officers use, use it? They have all kinds of coping mechanisms right. um, to push down their mental mental health and put it on the back burner, you know, because um, is it good or bad in your opinion? I think when somebody's pushing down, like I said, our bodies hate denial. 
and your body will let you know every time that you've been pushing something away for too long, whether it's a trauma and your body's letting you know by intrusive thoughts. And it does that by saying like, hey, look at me. Like, hey, look at me. Now I'm thinking about it all the time. Or maybe I don't think about it during the day and then at night it, it comes through in my, my nightmares, right? I think that there is a place and a time to know your audience and to know when the emotion is appropriate to share. You're always valid for having an emotion, but sometimes expressing it um, isn't, it's, it's not appropriate, right? It's just like a kid in a grocery store who's having a tantrum and the parent's job is to teach them like, well, you don't show those type of emotions right here, right now. You have to regulate it. You have to pull yourself together. We have to get through the task. And then when we get home, you know, we can talk about it or we can connect back to it. Same thing goes for first responders. Like, when you guys talk about going on the call, whether it's a reputation I have to uphold or whether it's like officer safety or whether it's like I don't have time to show the emotion, um, it's okay to, I don't want to push it down, but I want to like push it, push it to the side. Because if we push it down um, and you get really good at that, then I think that's where it becomes a problem because then you've really strengthened this part of your system. That's again, making the association emotions aren't needed. They're not okay. They're an interference. They're a burden. And now we're just pushing down everything when there's a lot of a, a lot of times in your life where emotional expression is healthy and it is important and it's it's needed, especially in relationships. You you have to be able to express those those things. Um, and so that's I mean you have to know. And it's not like a, it's on at work and then it's turned off over here or it's off on work and we turn it on. It's not a, an on and off switch. It's this like tactful dance of, you know, I'm putting it over here, but I know I have to come back to it. Because if I don't come back to it and I deny that, it's going to pop up later like daisies and not the fun, nice kind. It's, you know, it's going to pop up through drinking or a porn addiction or yelling at my kids or anxiety attacks or horrible nightmares or flashbacks body's going to let you know every time like hey we've been shoving for too long we're we're really good at ignoring minimizing denying and numbing you mm -hmm. know and then you, you talked about pushing it off to the side to deal with later the problem is I, I believe that a lot of officers that i know they push stuff off to the side and then they push more shit on top of it to the side and then more and more and then there's too much over there and they get overwhelmed they can't go back to it right here's also where life before becoming a first responder plays a role Right. And I, I told the recruits this the other night. I said, if, if we can have that pause of some self-awareness and if you can actually look for a moment, am I carrying some shit into this career? Am I walking into this career with already trauma that I haven't even looked at or things that I have been shoving for a long time? Um, whether it's from my childhood, whether it's from two years ago, if you're walking in already carrying that, you're like you said you're just going to add to it stacking it you're just going to stack it and so if you can get if you can address those things because the way that trauma works is you just have to look at it like right in the face you just have to look at it and recognize those feelings and you have to teach your system something new in that moment where it's okay to feel these things right now it wasn't okay to feel them on the job and this is where trauma processing in the therapy room comes into play, is when we slowly open up like that little vortex of trauma, your system's going to want to release. And the thing that's different now is you can release it. We can take pauses. Um, we can take a few deep breaths right here. You can put some words to it. Like at this point, I feel helpless. Or at this point, I actually feel really angry. Where when it was happening the first time, it's just all getting processed through the limbic system. You're not thinking through those things. You're just conditioned and now you're you're responding. So coming back to it, um, and not every trauma has to be processed. You have to have awareness to know if, if you're holding it. Um, in the same way that sometimes, you know, you guys say it's okay to not be okay. It's also okay to be okay after a, a trauma exposure. Our, our, we're pretty resilient individuals. Um, I think what's different for the first responder culture is you guys have it over and over and over and over again. So if if I were to say, okay, how can I do this in my own household where if there's an incident, I'm like, okay, is this one of those ones where I have to process or is this one of those ones that's going to haunt me later? Um, if you can just be really good at the whole comprehensive approach to it, but take the physiological approach first. So in those first 72 hours, right, because that's when you expect to have an acute stress response. If you've had a bad call, in those next three days, we have to turn on the awareness and be really tactful. So maybe alcohol, um, dipping, 
first pot of coffee, third energy drink. Maybe we just pull back a little bit on the things that actually directly directly impact our nervous system and let the nervous system find its rhythm again. Um, listen to your body. If you need to rest, allow it to rest. Um, if you find yourself isolating, cap it and get off of that couch. Move your system. If you feel like you want to say something about it, Say something about it. Um, and I know that as a first responder family member, first, responder, first responders don't always want to say it to their first responder family members because they want to protect them. Um, you don't have to go through all the gory details, but even just enough insight like, hey, um, bad call. Or even if it's a text message like, hey, bad call, kids involved. Or even if it's just, um, you know, bad shift. Then it's more about, okay, what are we going to need over the next three days or the next 24 hours? Like your body will let us know. Um, what are you going to need? Rather than you coming home, white knuckling it, keeping it close to the vest, and then responses are, what the hell's wrong with you? Right? Because one now adds to it. One now stacks on top of that trauma. And the other one actually just says like, okay, it's here. It, it's happening. Like how, how are we going to help ourselves with this? Do you think we use affiliation too much? We we identify as a police officer protector a firefighter and then we just we can't get out of that mold we can't leave that when we leave the job and go home and we and we try to be tough guy or 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 tough tough woman and we just cannot turn it off when we go home is that one of our our big problems that you see sure and again that comes back to associations and conditioning the system right so if we were to play a fun game and I was going to tell you to fill in the blanks on these three things because the way that the limbic system can get changed is that the lens changes on who you are, the lens lens changes on who others are, and on basically what this world is. So if I was going to ask the three of you, unfiltered, just fill in the blanks, the world is what? Complicated. Complicated. The world is what? Unpredictable. Unpredictable. The world is what? Predictable. Predictable. Um, a lot of times I hear fucked up. Are we allowed to cuss? Oh, yeah. Well, okay, we can good. now. You just, you just, <laughs> we well, just now we, I just have to get, explicit. Yeah, the explicit. Sorry about that. Thanks, Dr. T. <laughs> Sorry about that. Foul mouth. Usually <laughs> I hear things like what you guys said, but like, you know, the world is effed up. The world is um, dangerous. The world is disappointing, right? So that's now our conditioned response for the world. Others are what? The world is a kick in the crotch well what are others what are people people. others are inconsiderate inconsiderate. selfish selfish not what they seem to be not what they seem to be this is a fun game what they seem to be right (laughs) so then if i were to say okay in this complicated unpredicted predictable fucked up world where others are inconsiderate selfish um entitled um, incompetent, you are, the self is, you are, you have to be what in that type of world with those type of people? You have to coexist somehow. And, and you're, you're, there's parts of your life and part of your personality that have, may have little tiny pieces of all of that, right? Yeah. I mean, coexist is a very healthy response, right? You have to be aware. You have to be aware. Yeah, I think I was, I was going to say conscious. You got to be cognizant. You have to be cognizant of what to, what you're around. I right. So oh. I another thing I may hear when I do these trainings are like, you have to be ready. You have to protect. You have to fix. Because in a world that's all jacked up and others either can't fix it or they're um, too vulnerable to fix it and your job is to fix or to protect or to be ready. Now, you know, the lens has changed. And again, that part of the brain is very fast, about 500 milliseconds. Right. So it very fast. So now we're over here off duty and confirmation bias is happening again where you're like, oh, there it is. Told you the world's jacked up. Oh, there it is. Told you people are inconsiderate. Right. And there's this constant like confirmation that like I have to be ready. I have to protect. And so you not only identify it, I think it goes deeper than that. It's like it's more of a physiological like I've been conditioned to be the protector i've been conditioned to call to action i've been conditioned to be scanning and be aware because when you are not there are major risks to it right but if you know this about yourself and you can say okay in this in this situation i'm wanting to protect and i need actually to stop for a minute and say like what exactly am i protecting 
Um, is my desire to protect actually interfering with my ability to just be present? You have to constantly make an effort to turn off the, being hyper vigilant, right? You just just because you don't have to walk out the door and immediately be in in, in the red and and be on guard because um, shit's going to happen, right? You know, and, it, and there's some things that are out of your control, right? And when shit does happen, you guys are usually the quickest to respond because yeah. your career, your experiences have shaped you to be able to do that. Well, we also can't trained. go out looking for it. There's a lot of, I think there's a lot of people just walk out the door and they're just immediately just on guard. You see people, and I was, I've gotten better at this going to a crowded place of not looking around and almost just watching everybody and, right. and watching everybody's hands and just in a mat and imagining things that could happen. That's not healthy. Right. And because you can't even enjoy what the hell you're doing. I just right. thought that made me prepared. No. Okay. You know, I mean, well, you just, you, <laughs> well you're, you're prepared. You're, you're prepared, but, but for then nothing, you're not it's, present. It's a self created, yeah. yeah, it's something you create in your head. That, right. Yeah. yeah. And I think that goes back to the education piece, right? Mm -hmm. Because if you were to ask me that as a generality, you know, those are all very negative, right? Right. Very negative. And um, you talk about giving people grace all the time, right? Give yourself grace, give people grace. Uh, people know what serenity is and understanding your side of the street and the unpredictability of another side of the street and knowing that you can't do anything about that, right? I, I think once you're educated in that sense, it doesn't necessarily cure you, but it helps you create new fundamentals or a new tool toolbox to grab stuff from here as those intrusive thoughts hit and say, no, 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 this is, this is going to be one of those unpredictable, predictable things. Oh, I knew that was going to freaking happen because of X, Y, and Z. Now right. you're like, hold on a second, hold on. And then remove yourself from the situation and be able just to like look at it from above. Similar, I guess. Well, you're able to make a new lens, right? Because your brain will flag what you tell it is important. So if you're constantly telling your brain that this world is, you know, jacked up and, and considered and people are incompetent and you, and you constantly flag that, your, your brain will look for it. The same way if I tell you on the way home today, look, you know, keeping out for all the red trucks, <laughs> there's all of a sudden more red trucks, but you're now you're, you're looking for it. Yeah. And that's how these belief systems happen. So to, to modify them, um, you can modify them by challenging them, but you can also create a new lens where you just pendulum swing it. Where in this moment, like, okay, how is this actually, yes, e like, and using even those statement, even though this is a jacked up situation, like, is, is there any good in this, right? Or how are people actually quite resilient maybe i don't give people in my life enough credit and we see that all the time for the first responders who are really hard on themselves and don't give themselves any grace um because even the most skilled first responder is not always going to be able to change the outcome of these calls and that feels terrible and that's that helplessness and they don't give themselves a lot of grace and instead they start shooting s-h-o-u-l-d shooting on the, oh. the call like i should have done this i should have been more that we should have been quicker you should have you should have stepped up here you should have done this rather than sitting with the gosh we did the best we could with what we had and there's a little bit of that grace because if you're not practicing grace on the calls it's likely you're going home and you're not giving grace to the people in your life either that are most important right and now there's like a little mistake and when you talk about what are mistakes associated with for first responders mistakes are associated with death Mistakes are associated with like getting fired. Mistakes are not okay. And expectations of society, no mistakes from you guys. But to air is human. Like right. that's not it's even not fair. It's not fair. <clears throat> so you go home and now that's become your own expectation. And now you've got someone in your life you love who makes a little mistake and there's a big response and they're looking at you like, Whoa, like where's where's the grace here? Right? Dr. T, sometimes some of our listeners, they may be um, very hesitant to reach out or to come in, and they're very list-based. Give me some quick tools, a quick fix, kind of like that dip or that, uh, that pot of coffee that you talked about. That's, those are our mentalities. I think you have some tools in your arsenals, some quick things that can help. Yes. Okay, so... How to be a healthy first responder 101, ready, set, go. <laughs> okay, so if we break it into some of the components we've talked about today, um, like your thoughts, start thinking about how you're thinking. And if your thought process feels unfair or off-balanced or worst-case scenario all the time, um, start challenging it. If you can't challenge the way that you're thinking, share your thoughts out loud with people who care about you. Say the things out loud like, I'm, I'm feeling like I have failed you or I'm... Um, thinking worst case is this in this situation, like help me 
help me be a little bit more grounded, right? So think about how you're thinking. Share it with those who care. Um, behaviors. Take a, take a moment, even right now, to stop and reflect and say, okay, am I, am I okay with how I'm, how I'm choosing to behave, how I'm choosing to navigate this life, how I'm choosing how to navigate this career? Um, in your gut, if you are not okay with it, there's opportunity to do something different, right? Uh, your mood. If your mood feels all over the place, know that that's very common right after a critical incident um, and right after a shift. But if it feels like your mood is constantly all over the place, um, seek seek out some help. I mean, a lot of what therapy is, is just what you guys do when you practice, you know, practice how you play. Therapy is just more skills training. So a lot of times if the mood is off, it's because either there's behaviors that are not helping it or there's thoughts that are not helping it. So if we can get those two things uh, more healthy, the mood will stabilize. Um, Coming from a physiological standpoint, okay, the ways that you can regulate your nervous system, that thing is going to get really good at what it does with the exposure you're going to give it in this type of work. Um, But you can communicate it communicate with it when it acts up so one of the best ways to do that is how you breathe so are you guys okay if I take you through a little breathing exercise real quick okay um there's something called and I follow Andrew Huberman on uh, Instagram if you love the way that the system works he is phenomenal I think he's with Stanford and he's like the um you know like the human neuroscience uh expert there and so they've done a lot of different studies on how how we breathe, what types of breathing works. Obviously, you always need to be using your diaphragm. Um, If you're not using your diaphragm and you're not working that thing like a tool, you're really doing nothing for for your nervous system. So there's something called a physiological sigh that when you take a nice deep breath in, um, there's actually going to be a second inhale that you'll do. So it's actually two in through the nose and out through the mouth. And they've done different studies showing that one physiological sigh can help regulate the nervous system, make you feel a bit more calm, get you more into your parasympathetic activity, which is the downside of your nervous system, right? That that rest and digest piece. So if you've ever seen somebody crying really hard, um, it kind of looks like this, right? They're crying and you might see a physiological sigh sound like this. <laughs> Mm. right and they're taking that two in the reason they're doing it is because there's too much carbon dioxide build up so physiological size the quickest way to get the carbon dioxide out um, and that second inhale kind of pops all the little sacks open in your lungs if you have a dog who's about to take a nap and they hit the floor if you pay attention they will also do a physiological sigh you'll kind of hear through their nose this little like <laughs> and they kind of like shoot it out and then they and then they feel more calm So what that will feel like is you take a nice deep breath in, but put your hand over your belly button, make sure your diaphragm's working. So when you take a nice deep breath in, make sure that your stomach, your diaphragm is actually coming out, like you're filling up a balloon. And then for the physiological side, you're going to do one more at the top and then nice and slow controlled out through the mouth. And it's okay if you can't grab a lot of oxygen on that second pop. It's more about the take a nice deep breath in, one more pop, and then nice and slow out through the mouth. And just slowly empty that tank. And if you guys even just pay attention to what that feels like, when you do a nice deep breath in and pop one more and then out nice and controlled through the mouth, you should start to feel a little bit of this heavier feeling um, because your body's paying attention to not only you working your diaphragm, right? I can't ask my heart rate to slow down, but I can work my diaphragm in a way that actually makes either more room or less room by the heart sending signals to the brain to either increase my heart rate or slow it down. If you're tired. Yeah. And that's usually what a lot of my first responders say is when they actually just let their system rest, they'll be like, oh, I feel like I can fall asleep or I feel like I'm tired. I'm like, that just shows how much we're typically in your fight or flight. We're typically just Mm -hmm. going. That when you do one physiological sigh, it's like, holy cow, that rest feeling, right? That's like a vacation for your nervous system. Implement those physiological sighs even when you're not stressed. So I challenge you like every red light on the way home, physiological sigh right or if you're pulling into that driveway after a tough shift and you know you've got people inside that house or that apartment who are waiting for you and who need you give yourself a minute in the car of just some silence maybe the windows down and take a few physiological sighs to help your system regulate after the shift and now you can head in and now it's more about awareness what do they need what do I need now we can navigate it because now we're more in a a state of calm still alert but we're calm right? Another cool thing for physiological um, regulation, cold showers, right? So what do we know about cold water exposure? They suck. Um, They suck. It's really uncomfortable when it's happening. But there's this piece to it where 
physiologically, um, not only does it decrease cortisol levels, it decreases inflammation, but it also activates your lymphatic system, which is responsible for pulling toxics away for some of your major organs, including your heart. Um, and the heart takes a beating in this type of career because you're constantly asking it to go up and then come back down and then go up and come back down. So that can build up toxins. And so a cold shower is really helpful. There's also a psychological component to it. That if best way to do this is if you're in the shower, right, research shows about five minutes a day of some type of practicing self-induced stress, which is what a cold shower would be. Five minutes is a long time, even if you can practice 30 seconds. So turn that shower to the cold, look at that freaking shower head, and I want you to mentally be like, okay, like bring it on, bitch, like here we go. And, and that thing's going to hit, and you're going to have to regulate your system. You're not getting out of that shower, and you're going to tolerate how uncomfortable it is because if you let that shower become kind of a s- symbolic of stress outside of that shower, the next time, it's not a shower head, but the next time life you know, throws some crap at you or next time a coworker throws some crap at you or someone out on the street throws some crap at you you'll have this like new sense of like I can handle this I can tolerate it because you are practicing stress and distress tolerance at home right so that's another cool way to practice it yeah. um the last piece is the trauma exposure um pay attention your body will let you know what it needs right so if you feel like you have been stacking trauma for years and your body's starting to let you know. Um, and it doesn't always show up in, in a big flashback or a, a nightmare. Sometimes it's more subtle, like I just feel more on edge or I feel disconnected all the time. Um, or I just, I constantly am seeing the bad or I have some of those intrusive thoughts. Go in for some trauma processing, right? I mean, that's, that's our way of teaching the system to make a new association with the trauma. You can't get rid of the memory, unfortunately, but you can process it in a different way that it didn't get processed the first time, that then that means it gets stored in a different place in the brain, which it means if I need to pull that thing off of the bookshelf and look at it, I can, rather than that thing's just flying off the bookshelf all the time and I have no control over it, right? Is it like closing a book as opposed to leaving it open at all times in your mind with a graphic image just showing nonstop? Right. Replaying. You just find a way to mentally close that book. Trauma can get stuck in the limbic system. Um, and a lot of times it's, it's, a, it's a sensory. So it's either like I, I keep smelling it um, or I keep seeing this one detail or I keep hearing the scream. Like it can get stuck in that part of the brain that took it in when you were in fight or flight because the prefrontal part was was offline right those things work separately so if it's going back and actually slowly opening that thing up and again using the prefrontal to help guide the narrative and to actually process that all components of it it can again get stored differently than just like you said that open chapter in your limbic system um and it's just know that no first responder comes into any first trauma processing and they're like, I'm really excited about this. Like, let's do it. <laughs> they come in terrified and they come in like, I don't know what this is going to feel like. I've literally told my system, we don't look at this, um, but avoidance will backfire every time. Like you constantly denying it to your system. It just means it's going to push even harder. So you come in and you practice feeling, uncom- feeling uncomfortable and you will build resilience to it. And then it'll feel like I have more control over this trauma rather than this trauma taking control over my life and the people I love. Really good question. First offers the the wellness checks. Yes. Even out of state. Can you cover that, please? Yes. So part of first services, um, wellness checks, I always tell them it is not a therapy session. It's not a fitness for duty evaluation. A wellness check for a department is literally a 30-minute check-in on a department's people just to... First, give a little bit of the educational piece so that the individual knows, you know, this is how trauma shows up or this is how your on-duty experiences can show up off-duty. Once we have some of that awareness, um, then we tap into if there's any concerns, um, if it is showing up in a certain way, and if it is, how are you navigating it? What are you using to um, help address it? Is it working? More importantly, how do we know it's working? Like if I had your spouse in the room, would she say it's working? And if it's not working, it's an opportunity for us to hopefully give you some new skills think of it maybe more differently um, or just start paying attention to it. Um, And that can be a nice stepping stone to if, if you are needing something more, Hey, I I recommend, you know, you see, you see someone for this, but the wellness check can be done remotely. We can go across state lines with that because it's not therapy. It's, it's just a wellness check. Um, I, I always recommend the best way that I've learned with departments is
is I usually come in and do a department-wide resiliency training. So everybody has the educational piece under their belt. And then that way, the 30-minute check-in is really tailored to what they learned in that educational piece. Now they're applying it to their life. Mm -hmm. And then it's like, if you need anything, please reach out. If not, I'll see you next year. And then next year, you know, we check in based on what this last wellness check was. So if they bring up things like my wife's about to have a baby, or I'm going after a promotion, or we're thinking about moving, then when I see them the next year, I can check in on like, how are you doing with some of those things? So we're just constantly keeping the self-awareness practice and even 30 minutes a year. Um, it's the same way that we check in on you guys physically. Got to make sure that the sign of work isn't breaking down the system physically. We got to make sure that mentally we are we are approaching this thing as tactfully as possible. Um, so yeah, wellness checks is a great option. It's a great starting place for any department. Speaking of reaching out and uh, and keeping checks on us, how can the listener look you up and, and look up your organization? So. Um, our website, because we are that um, that joint venture with Sports Academy, the website is currently being updated to reflect all of the services, whether it's a strength and conditioning class, whether it's a resiliency training with myself, whether it's um, a retirement prep. We do also retirement prep through FIRST, where if someone is planning on retiring within the next 12 months, they come in through the program. We do a few assessments just to see how their system is, and then we recommend, like, hey, this is what would be helpful for you. Um, so there's a lot of different things we're putting together to accurately reflect on the website. But in the meantime, you can still look at the old site. It should be updated probably within the next week. Um, but the old Old site is www dot first, and the I in first is the number one instead of an I dash tx dot org. Um, you can also, if you are uh, in Texas and you are seeking therapy through first, you can call four six nine. 3527491 um and everything's confidential and we take all major insurance companies and if someone's like I don't want to use my insurance we have ways around that first is also on most departments EAPs um and then first is also supported by, by this really great foundation called assist the officer where um we can if someone is you know the financial piece is is causing problems um through ATO, FIRST can offer seven free sessions, and ATO covers the cost, which is incredible. Um, so there are ways around that if the th if the pricing is something that's a concern. But I will tell you, it always depends on deductible, but most co-pays are around $25. Um, if you are interested in a training um, or a mobile wellness training, that's where we basically take – all the experts between FIRST and Sports Academy, the human performance coaches, the PTs, nutritionists, myself, and all the equipment, and we come to your department, and we train about 50 of your individuals. Um, not only is it an experience, but it's also we gather data. So with the Cognition Lab, that's part of it. We can come back and then give trends to the chief, basically saying like, okay, 80% of your people um, actually scored in this range on the Cognition Lab, which means there might be a shoot, no shoot issue, or if, you know, 40% of them are showing major concerns for a shoulder injury. Like these are some of the things that we recommend you you start putting in place to just take better care. So it really individualizes it to the department. Um, so if you are, you're interested in more of the trainings, the mobile wellness training, the retirement prep, all of that good stuff, then you'd call the training number, which is 469-525-6482. Um, I have an Instagram where I do some behind the scenes stuff, give some helpful tips, and that is uh, dr.t.first, and again, the I is replaced with the number one, and that's on Instagram, so follow along, um, and then also on Facebook, it's dr.t.texas, and those are some ways that we can connect. Um, and if you ever want to send me an email, like if you're hearing this podcast and you have a follow-up question, um, you can contact me through dr.t at h-t-w-e-d-e-l-l dot -E -E -L -L org. <laughs> Hence why I'm referred to as Dr. T <laughs> instead of Dr. Twiddell. Um, but yeah, lots of ways that we can stay connected and ways that I can help support your department if you don't have something in place or you do have something in place and we just want to energize it a little bit with some of the recent research and, and expertise that we have. We'd love to, love to support the departments. Doc, whenever we uh, publish this episode, we'll, I'll make sure this is put out on our social media and also on the podcast description, which will be on all the major uh, platforms. Awesome. 
So, because there's a lot of uh, first responders across the country. I get emails all the time from West Virginia to Virginia to California that are uh, giving feedback on the podcast. And I'm That's sure so that cool. they will benefit from this. That's so cool. Yeah. And if you are either part of a peer team or you don't have a peer team and you just want to come to get like a three-day comprehensive insight into your own health and how this job might be impacting you and your family, um, our next three-day event, Peer Support and Resiliency Training, is March 30th through April 1st. And that is at Sports Academy at the Star here in Frisco. Um, and if you want to completely switch it up with how we get resiliency training in there, then meet us out at Our Watch. It's a nonprofit that I'm a part of. And we use uh, horses to um, help first responders and their family members. It's not horseback riding. If it was, I would not be a part of it. It's all groundwork, um, and it's really practicing that limbic system regulation because there's nothing more like getting your, your system jacked up by putting you in a round pen with a horse and nothing but the two of you. And all of a sudden, people's heart rates come up. And then we can do something different in that moment if we see either a, a pattern or their head goes to a really place of, you know, um, criticism or being hard on themselves it's that experiential in the moment learning that we can do something different and that's also really cool um and again that's our watch uh i think it's www.ourwatchtx.org okay fantastic they they mentioned in the training with with the horses that they have the ability to and i may not word this right absorb right um will you explain that yeah i mean i this is where the equus coaches are really more informed about the horses but basically you know What's cool about horses is that they are herd animals and they're extremely hypervigilant, just like the rest of you. So they look out for each other um, and they can feel each other. It's like there's this energy zone that goes out about 10 feet from the horse's heart. So if when you come out to the ranch, you become a part of the herd. And if we have a first responder who's dysregulated, maybe they are detached and numbed out, or maybe they're just kind of on edge or they're really irritable that day. The first, the, the the horse is going to pick up on it and the horse lets us know, um, because horses are large animals. They like to be at baseline. Um, they don't want to be all over the place, right? They want their herd to be nice and regulated. So if, if one of us is not regulated, the, the, the horse lets us know in all types of fun ways, but it's a moment of like a wake up call of like, gosh, how am I showing up in this moment? Cause if I can be more aware of that. I'll be more aware when I'm not in that space and I might be at home yeah. and be like, holy cow, like how am I showing up in this moment? And am I okay with it in the moment learning? The horse is like, Dr. T, get this guy shit in gear. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> He's messing up the herd. Right. And it's right. helping you be self-aware. Yes, exactly. I've heard the equine therapy is phenomenal. And when we went out to the, uh, the, the three-day seminar, they had a booth set up and yes. they went over it and it was it's cutting edge, really. Yeah, and we just had a couples workshop on uh, this last Saturday, and kind of to fall in line with like Valentine's Day, we focused on communication and connection, and how when one is altered, the other one gets impacted. Like if we're not connected, our communication tends to to falter, and then when we are not communicating real well, our communi- our connection then falters. Um, we also do just spouses out there, which is cool too. So um, sometimes the spouses of first responders, significant others of first responders, they come out to the horse ranch and it's a place for them to also regulate themselves. Because don't think that just because you're a first responder, you're the only one whose system is going like this. You, there is such a thing as you know nervous system synchronization. Your family members do this with you. Um, and we always talk about, you know, first responders have a front row seat to trauma and horrible things, and they do. But first responder family members have a front row seat to how it looks like when they get home. And that can be a helpless feeling, too, to see your family member so exhausted or zoned out or putting on a good face or having to leave again when they finally just got comfortable sitting with everybody at the table. Um, that takes a toll as a, as a family member who, you know, you love your family members, you want them to be okay, and you watch them go and, and serve their communities in a way which is where the family member pride comes in, but not without consequences. Um, and the first responder family members have to be taken care of too, which again is really what fuels me to, um, you know, having that front row seat for my dad and my brother, you look at these departments and you're like, please take care of them. Like, please take care of them. And when I hear you say you don't have a wellness budget, get one. Get one. Because what's the point of having the fancy cars and the the trucks and all the equipment if the person using them is depleted and falling apart? Right. And then then everybody else around them falls apart. They push away friends. They push away spouses and and family members. Yeah. And it just spider webs and everything turns to shit. Yeah, I mean, it comes back to awareness. And I think that's one thing 
we've done pretty good on this podcast with doing and people like you out there pushing that, making sure everybody knows it. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. I hope if there's like one thing you take away, it's to have grace for yourself, but to also just become more aware. It's okay to stop and look at your life. And if something's not settling or if something you're not super proud of, that's the cool thing with relationships and with life. Like you can change it. You can say, I'm sorry. We can take ownership and we can do something different, um, but not without awareness. Right. Thank you for your drive for creating an atmosphere where officers can come to you and to your team and it be okay and it not be weak. It actually is um, strong Mm -hmm. to do it. And so thank you very much. Of course. Yeah, Doc, I want to thank you for your service. It's very selfless. Um, You do it for a reason. You have a passion for it. It Not only affected you as a child, obviously, with your family, but it's something that you've continued on and it's uh, I don't know. I mean, just to say, I'm, I mentioned this quite a bit to people that come through here, but it's very, very synonymous with everyone that walks through these doors at some point in time. But you're the, the impact you've had on uh, people is uh, very significant. Uh, Thank you. Can't even think of the number of lives you've not only impacted, but saved, literally saved. And uh, I personally want to thank you. So thank you, Josh. I really appreciate that. All right. Thank you for taking all this time out of your very busy schedule yeah. and coming out and spend time with us. And I want you to take this time right now. This is your stage to give some final thoughts for the listener. Yeah, I think with everything we covered today, um, I, you know, like I said before, this is the toughest job on the planet. What we ask of human beings to go and do and, and what drives them to do it, to serve others and then to come home just to really barely recover to then prepare to go back um, and all the sacrifices, you know, thank you so much. But with that, please, please be intentional. You, you have a responsibility as an individual. Um, we, we obviously put a lot of responsibility on the departments, right, to, you know, put the programs in place, make room for the budgets, make this a priority, take care of your people who are there right now. Um, but if you're listening and you're like, wow, my department does none of that, then you have a responsibility too. And if you're a first responder family member, like you have a responsibility too, you know, and, and if we can hold on to that responsibility and be, be delicate with it, um, respect it, but then be better because of it. And, you know, like I said before, you can have a quality life and this career at the same time, but you just, you have to be, you have to be strategic. You have to work harder um, than the average, but it's, it's a, a group that is one that I'm honored to be a part of. I'm honored to sit at this table with the rest of you because I know there's a lot of experience in this room, which as a psychologist, I know that there's a lot of trauma and threat exposure in this room. And the fact that you three come together to try to impact someone else's life in your busy lives, um, you guys are serving again and, you know, true, true servants. And I just appreciate that in you as human beings. That's, That's not easy to find in people. So thank you for what you're doing with this podcast. Thank you, Doc. It's a perfect way to wrap it up. And you will be back on this as a guest co-host at some point. I hope you know that. (laughs) I look forward to it. You get it in the calendar. (laughs) Yeah. Thank you, Doc. Thanks. Thanks, Doc. Hey, brother. Hey, sister. I'll never give up on you. Hey, Mrs. Hey, mister. I'll see this all the way through. No matter how far the sun and the moon, I'll never give up on you. Down when you're lonely, I'll pull you up. Clock leaves you heavy. I'll be your shoulder Together we'll run Up from the bottom Yeah, we'll rise above Hey brother, hey sister I'll never give up on you Hey Mrs. Hey mister I'll see this all the way
upon you. Hey, Mrs. Hey, Mister, I'll see this all the way through. No matter how far for the gold and the blue, I'll never give up on.